Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Podcast here on the John Campia YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and I am so glad you decided to make me a part of your Friday. And this is what we're going to do on the show here today. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff going on in the worlds of entertainment, particularly movies and television. But where do we get our topics from? It's simple. I get my topics from you guys, the topics and the questions that you guys send in to me. How do you get a topic or a question on the John Campia podcast? It's simple. Just email me anytime at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Once again, that's the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Just send in your questions. I can't guarantee I get them all on the show, but I try to get as many as I can. And today, I've got six topics and questions that I've taken from you guys. If you want a sneak peek as to what those questions and topics are, look into the description of this video and you'll see them right now. So, without any further ado, let's dive into the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Kent Grabber. And Kent Grabber writes... My question today is with the critical failure of Tom Cruise's The Mummy and that supposed franchise, wouldn't it have been made more sense to add horror films that have previously had commercial success, like the new Stephen King's It movie? With that critical acclaim, having that single film in the Dark Universe franchise would have changed how moviegoers and critics view the series. All right, thanks a lot for the question, Kent. And yeah, It is out in theaters right now. Uh, my review is up for it here on my YouTube channel. You can find it here on my YouTube channel. I quite enjoyed the film. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's a great merger. This is what I said in my review. It's an R-rated horror film, but it's also very much like a kid's film. It's like a kid's coming-of-age movie film almost. Um, it's kind of like Stand By Me, but with a killer demonic clown. I mean, if you can imagine that. And it's done very, very well, and I liked it a great deal. Now, let's talk about The Mummy for a second. I am unique and a little bit rare um, in the film world in that I did not dislike The Mummy. I didn't love it. I didn't think it was great. I certainly thought it should have been a lot better, and I absolutely thought it had its problems. Yes. But I still thought overall it was an okay movie. But that's about as much as I can say. I thought it was okay. I, there were certainly things about it that I enjoyed, certainly things about it that I thought should have been done better. But I thought it was okay. Not the big start to this dark universe, this shared horror universe that Universal is trying to set up. It, absolutely not. They wanted something much more successful. Now, it's not like it's a huge absolute bomb. The movie has crossed $400 million worldwide. So it has roughly made as much of, if not more than, Mad Max Fury Road. Actually, you know what? Give me a second here. I'm going to pull that up. Mad Max Fury Road. Um... And we'll just see how much that made at the box office. But I'm pretty sure it's roughly the same amount. That, yeah, Mad Max Fury Road didn't make $400 million. So I don't think we can jump up and down and call, you know, uh, The Mummy this big, huge, amazing flop. And then call Mad Max Fury Road a hit when Dark Universe, The Mummy, made more money <laughs> than Mad Max Fury Road did. And they cost roughly the same amount of money to make, I think. I think uh, The Mummy might have been a little bit more expensive. At, at any rate, still... You know Universal wanted $700 million or $800 million. That's what they were aiming for. That's what they were hoping for. And they didn't get it. So now we have to step back and it's made all of us question the overall strategy and plan for this dark universe that Universal is setting up. And, and the one thing that the question is bringing up is, well, instead of just like the mummy and Dracula and Frankenstein, the invisible man and whatever else they're going to be doing. Shouldn't they have gotten more popular horror franchises and put them in? Like, like It. They should have put It in it. Well, okay, let's address the first major problem. Uh, it does not belong to Universal. <laughs> it is a Warner Brothers production, so you could not use It. It could not be in there no matter what. The second thing, though, is that the whole kind of, you know, shtick of the dark universe, and shtick is not a bad word. Shtick is, is, can, can be good, it can be bad, but... The whole shtick of the Dark Universe is that it's the universal classic monsters being brought back to the big screen in its own cinematic universe. The classics, the Wolfman, the Invisible Man, uh, Dracula, you know, probably Frankenstein at some point, and obviously the Mummy. That's the whole identity of Dark Universe. So even if they were able to get and they had the rights to it, 
I, you shouldn't put it in it because that's not what the identity of the dark universe is supposed to be. Now, as far as your other comments about how with all the critical acclaim that it had, it was never a movie before. There, there was it was a television miniseries once, but it had there is no movie critical acclaim because it was never a movie. And I think you're overestimating now that the new it is out and everybody loves the new it as well. We all should. I think you're overestimating just how popular it was before. Not everybody knew and not everybody loved the old, you know, TV incarnation of it. A lot of people love the novel, absolutely. But I'm not quite sure that it or Pennywise the Dancing Clown is as popular or as well known as The Mummy or Dracula or Frankenstein or The Wolfman. Maybe more popular than The Invisible Man, but... So I don't really think so. Even if Universal could get its hands on the rights to, you know, Jason and Friday the 13th and Freddy and all that kind of stuff, do you put them in the dark universe? I say no, personally, because that's not what the identity is supposed to be. And no, the one thing you asked in your question was, you know, if it was in the cinematic universe, would it have made critics and fans respond more positively? No, because the mummy is still the mummy. The mummy is still the exact same movie. Even if you were going to do an it movie later, in the dark universe, that doesn't change how good or bad the mummy was. The mummy was what it was. It wasn't going to change people's opinions of it just because of what's coming further down the line. So, no, I think Universal has the right idea. Whether or not they executed the mummy right or not is another question. But I think Universal trying to revive all the classic Universal monsters is a good idea. In principle, it's a good idea. It's now all about whether they can execute. And clearly, they didn't execute well enough on The Mummy to get more people excited or on board with it. So that's going to be the key. Now, if the next movie comes out and it's a big hit, then it completely changes the conversation. We're just going to have to wait and see how that all turns out. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. We move on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Paul McGilligott. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And Paul writes, If Ryan Johnson directs Star Wars Episode Nine, wouldn't he likely want to do his own rewrite on the script? And could this lead to Lucasfilm delaying the movie to December of 2019 to give him more time? And wouldn't this be the case for any top-tier director? I can't imagine Ron Howard, Steven Spielberg, Matt Reeves, Matt v Matthew Vaughn, or a director of similar, similar caliber not wanting to put their own imprint on the screenplay. All right, thanks a lot for the question, Paul. And yeah, ever since we found out that uh, Colin Trevorrow was booted off Star Wars Episode Nine, and they, oh, sorry, not booted, it was mutually decided. That means they booted him off. Anyway... Ever since they booted him off, um, and, and you know, maybe part of it was that he didn't want to do it either anymore. The big question now floating around, who's going to direct episode nine? Who's it going to be? Now, I think clearly the, the four main names that would be in contention here are John Favreau, Steven Spielberg, Ron Howard, and Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson, obviously, because he's doing episode eight right now, and everybody seems to be loving the job he's doing. And this is important. Ryan Johnson doesn't have any other directing gigs lined up right now. So his schedule is open. Ron Howard, obviously because he's he swept in to save the day on Han Solo. Well, we'll wait and see the movie. But theoretically, he swept in to save the day with Han Solo. He is one of the greatest directors of our generation. He's fantastic. So maybe one of the reasons he came in to do Han Solo is that he could then follow up and do episode nine. That's a possibility. Steven Spielberg, obviously his connection to Ron Howard, to, to Ron Howard, Steven Spielberg's connection to George Lucas. He did some work on Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. He is the greatest filmmaker of all time. However, he's getting Ready Player One ready to launch. He's shooting The Post at the same time. And then he's supposed to roll into Indiana Jones 5. So I'm not sure that can happen. And then John Favreau, who's kind of like the darling at Disney right now for what he did with The Jungle Book. However, he is kind of tied up with Lion King. So I think Ryan Johnson is probably the front runner. He's the first guy I would put my money on to direct Star Wars Episode Nine. But the question is, if he were to come and do episode nine, wouldn't he want to write the script? Not necessarily, because I think part of the story of episode nine was based on his treatment anyway. I think he did the initial treatment for episode nine. He was originally going to write the script for episode nine, too. So he did the first treatment of it. So he's already very familiar with the story and where it's going to go. And I'm pretty sure he's probably comfortable with that right now. Would he want to have his input on the script? Absolutely. 
Would uh, Ron Howard want to have his input on the script? Sure, but Ron Howard isn't a guy who writes his own scripts. He used to decades ago, but Ron Howard doesn't write his own scripts now. He just likes to direct. Steven Spielberg used to write his screenplays decades ago, but he hasn't really written his uh, written screenplays in a long time, so he wouldn't want to write the screenplay. Names like Matthew Vaughn, um, Matt Reeves, yeah, they still do like to write their own scripts, but don't always write their own scripts. So, but I think it's safe to say that any director coming in on episode nine would want to have their input on the script. And that's fine. The movie's not scheduled to start shooting till 2018. We are months and months and months away from that happening. So I really don't think, let's say theoretically, if Ryan Johnson wanted to come on and direct Star Wars episode nine, and he wanted to have put in some work on the script to, to touch up the script and kind of shape the script a little bit, as long as Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm agree, then really it wouldn't take that long because it's not like it's a page one rewrite. And even if it was a page one rewrite, they already know where they want the story to go at this point. So I would argue that I think there's still plenty of time. As long as they don't wait three months to bring the new director on board, but... If Han Solo is any indication, when they got rid of Lord and Miller, they brought on Rod Howard pretty quick. I think we're going to hear an announcement, an official announcement about Star Wars Episode Nine, fairly soon. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Lucasfilm was already picked. And here's one scenario. I'm going to throw this out there, okay? My scenario here is that I believe they have already decided, and I think it's Ryan Johnson, and they they already know. Ryan Johnson knows he's going to direct Episode Nine. Disney already knows they're going to, but they're going to hold off. They might, I'm just theorizing here, hold off on announcing it until Star Wars Episode Eight comes out. So that when Star Wars Episode Eight comes out and everybody's talking about how great the movie is and everybody's talking about how big of a hit the movie is, then Disney swoops in and goes, good news, folks, the director of this wonderful movie, Episode Eight, is now our director for Episode Nine, And they're going to set it up like that to really push the PR. But in reality, he would have been attached for months already and probably doing work on it for months already. So, uh, yes, I do think any top caliber director coming in will want to have input on the script at least but i think there's there's still plenty of time for them to do that and be ready for the beginning of shooting all right thanks a lot for the question man we move on now to the next question and the next question today comes to us from christian moreno who writes many question uh, my question is regarding multi-picture contracts for actors in the new movies coming from dc that seem to separate from the dceu with DC potentially moving forward with this Elseworld Joker, could we potentially see more actors willing to appear in these films without having to agree to multiple films since the films would not be in a cinematic universe? Thanks a lot for the question, Christian. It's a great question because we all remember what happened with Doctor Strange, right? I believe that Disney's first choice for Doctor Strange, they had agreed in terms of entering into negotiations with Joaquin Phoenix. And he was going to be Doctor Strange. Now, we ended up with Benedict Cumberbatch as uh, Doctor Strange, and he was awesome in it. I loved him in that role. But yeah, we were all also very excited to see Phoenix in the role. And reportedly, the thing that threw the wrench and kind of screwed everything up was that Marvel, understandably so, Marvel is insistent to have a large multi-film deal in place. They, want, they don't just want to sign you for one movie. They want to sign you for four or five movies. Why? Because they don't want to run into the same situation that they did with Robert Downey Jr. Where it's like, okay, we signed him to like one or two movies, but oh, look, now the movie's a big, huge hit. We want him to come back, but now he's playing hardball and wants a billion dollars to come back. Robert Downey Jr. didn't ask for a billion dollars. I'm just saying, now he wants a billion dollars to come back. So Marvel is being very, was being very smart business-wise saying, hey, we need to, if you want to come into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we want you. That's great. However, we have to agree to a four-film deal or a five-film deal or a six-film deal or whatever you have it. And Joaquin Phoenix didn't want to do that. He didn't want to commit to that many movies. Totally understand from his point of view. Totally understand it from Disney's point of view. And Disney said, okay, no problem. No, no bad blood here. We go our separate ways. We're going to go look for another actor who is open to signing a four or five film deal. And they went and they got Benedict Cumberbatch and the rest is history. So the question though is, now that it looks like Disney and Warner Brothers, I mean, is moving, they are trying to develop the standalone Joker movie. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but they are developing it and kind of putting it together to see what they want to do. 
Well, since they're doing a movie that's a complete standalone and sits outside of the DCEU, the question is, could we potentially see an actor like Leonardo DiCaprio, who you can see here, uh, like Leonardo DiCaprio or Joaquin Phoenix, could we see these guys who maybe traditionally wouldn't sign on for an MCU or a DCEU movie because of the multiple film deal, could we see these guys come into a one-shot movie because they don't have to sign a multiple film deal? Could we get a Joaquin Phoenix now in a comic book movie since we he doesn't have to worry about signing a multi-film contract? He knows he's coming in to do a one-shot. Maybe he signs a two-film deal, but he doesn't have to worry about a four, five, six, seven-film deal. Could that become more appealing to actors like that? I think there are two versions of that answer. The first version of the answer is, Yes, in principle, yes. I think Joaquin Phoenix had Doctor Strange just been a one-shot movie and they didn't need him for multiple films. I'm pretty sure he would have done it. Will this be more appealing to an actor like Leonardo DiCaprio, one of the best actors in the world right now? Would he be more willing to come in and do a comic book movie and do The Joker, understanding he doesn't have to sign a five-film deal. All he's got to do is a one, at most, maybe two-film deal. You know, for its standalone and maybe a sequel. I mean, that's it. Does it become more appealing to them at that point? Yes, I think it does. However, the very nature of your question implies that there's a whole bunch of top-tier actors out there who just refuse to be in comic book movies. And while that might have been true six years ago, ten years ago, that's just not the case anymore. Today, guys like Joaquin Phoenix are the rare exception. Because today, you have a lot of the top actors in combo. I mean, Robert Redford, for heaven's sakes, was in Captain America's Civil or Winter Soldier. I mean, Robert Redford. We've got some of the most iconic, big, Oscar-winning talent in movies today. I mean, just Gandhi, for heaven's sakes, Gandhi was in Iron Man 3. How much bigger do you get than that than Robert Redford? Than Robert Downey Jr. You got now Benedict Cumberbatch. You got these guys loaded with Brie Larson. As another Academy Award winner who's in there. Ben Affleck is in comic book movies. You've got Henry Cavill is in the comic book movies. You, look, the, the point is, is that for the majority of big name talent, they're already willing to do these comic book movies and they're willing to sign the multi-film deals because these are the biggest movies in the world right now. So guys like Joaquin Phoenix and maybe Leonardo DiCaprio, but Leonardo DiCaprio's never said he didn't want to do a comic book movie. So a guy like a Joaquin Phoenix, he's the exception now. He's the rare exception. So I don't think we have to wait for something to happen to open up the floodgate so more top-tier actors will want to come in and do comic book movies. They're already doing comic book movies and a lot of great talent, and we're seeing better and better comic book movies as a result. Anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. We move on now to the fourth topic today, and the fourth question today comes to us from John De La Torre, and John writes, Just wanted to get your thoughts on something. Justice League reportedly had a budget of $220 million, but with the long production schedule, reshoots reportedly in the tens of millions of dollars, plus the marketing campaign, do you think Justice League will turn out to be the most expensive movie ever made? Thanks a lot for the question, John, and it's a fair question. The price tag on Justice League is climbing. However, let's keep one thing in mind. Pardon me. If there was ever going to be a most expensive movie ever made, wouldn't it make sense for that movie to be an Avengers Infinity War or a Justice League movie? Like, wouldn't that movie kind of justify being one of the most expensive movies ever made? Not just because of their importance, but look at the scope of production. You're talking about six or seven major superheroes with a couple of big, big stars in a visual effects and CGI heavy environment with these big, massive superhero team-up movies. If there's ever going to be a film that could justifiably be one of the most expensive movies ever made, it would be a Justice League. It would be an Avengers. So it's not like we have to say, oh, 
Justice League is going to be one of the most expensive movies ever made, as if that's a bad thing. It's like if there was ever a movie that would kind of justify that type of big price tag, it is a movie like Justice League. So there's that. But on the other hand, to just straight up answer your question, could Justice League be like the most expensive movie ever made? The answer to that is no. It's not going to come anywhere close, actually. Well, I mean, relatively close, but it's not going to come really close. Uh, I believe it was like Pirates of the Par Caribbean uh, on Stranger Tides. It is the reported most expensive movie ever made. Now, I believe the, they say that the production budget ended up being like $326 million. But even that number is only after the studio got tax credits back. Before they got tax credits back, that movie reportedly came in north of $410 million to produce. Now, granted, you do count tax credits that you get back against the production. Yes, absolutely. But even then, at north of $300 million, I believe it's like $326 million, that is pretty much recognized, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, as the most expensive movie ever made. I do not think, no matter how long the reshoots go, that Justice League will touch that. Unless... By some strange aberration, they, you know, a brand new CEO of Warner Brothers comes in. They decide I don't like this Justice movie, Justice League movie, and they scrap it and start again from page one and have and double their budget. But that's not going to happen. So unless that were to happen, I don't think Justice League is going to be the most expensive movie ever made. It's an expensive movie. Movies today, something's got to change in the movie production world because movies cost too much to make, and when they cost more to make. They have to get make up that money somewhere. So there's a systemic problem within the movie going experience where the, the expense of the more expensive movies gets passed on to you and me, the movie goer, with increased ticket prices. And that's what happens. So we as film fans should be pretty insistent that Hollywood gets a handle on how much they're spending on making their movies because the more they spend on making the movies, the higher the price the tickets get the higher the price of tickets become. And that means ultimately you and me are paying for it. I had this argument with some people before. It's like, why should we care how much the studio spends on a movie? It's not our money. Yes, it is our money. Because you know who pays for those, those extra expensive movies? You and me, because they jack up the ticket prices. So don't think that you don't pay for it, because yes, you do, and so do I. And we should really start making some noise as fans to the studio system about how much they spend on making these damn movies. Anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. We move on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Bruce Gordon. And Bruce Gordon writes, just seen it and loved it. So did I, man. My question is, with its success, do you think it may encourage studios to attempt to make quality adaptations of King's classic novels because movie viewers are screaming out for them? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Bruce. I'm going to disagree with you on one thing. Uh, movie, there's not en masse a large segment of the movie-going public screaming out for more Stephen King adaptations. That's, that's not happening. Maybe you are, and maybe some of your buddies are, and maybe some of the chat boards that you hang out in are, but on a big scale, the mass audience are not. They're not saying they don't want them either, but there's not like everybody you go to, you walk into a McDonald's and all you hear is people talking about how, damn, we need to get more Stephen King movies. Don't we need more Stephen King movies? That, that's not the conversation. So I just want to get that out of the way. Um, but l how quickly we forget there was just another Stephen King movie released just we literally in terms of weeks ago with Dark Tower. Dark Tower was just out. Didn't work out so well. And then you say, yeah, 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 but, but shouldn't studios want to make quality adaptations? Well, look, I've said this before. I will say it again. I will always say this. Every studio with every movie they make are trying to make a quality movie. They're all, the, the starting point, they never start going, ah, let's just make a piece of crap. No, they want to make lots of money. So they know that if you make the movie good, you'll make more money. No matter how much money a bad movie makes, like say a Transformers, doesn't matter how much money a bad movie makes, they would have made more money if the movie had been great. Had the movie been great, they would have made even more money. So studios knew that, so they always start out thinking you're going to make a quality thing. But making a good movie, as I say all the time, is one of the most impossible things in the world. It's one of the most impossible things in the world. Making a good movie, everybody acts like it's easy. Oh, just make a good movie. It's one of the hardest things in the world. And there's a reason why there are so very few people, percentage-wise, on our planet who are capable of making good movies. But I think one of the things that we'll do for sure is definitely increase the hunger for it too. 
and maybe increase some interest in some of Stephen King's other horror stuff. Uh, but we'll just have to wait and see. I, I don't, I, like I said, I don't sense this large public screaming out for more Stephen King movies. There are certainly some of us who feel that way. But uh, we'll see what happens after it has finished its run. I hope it does really well at the box office because, uh, like I said, the movie is really good. It's, it's not the best movie of the year or anything like that, but it's a really good movie. If you haven't seen it yet, make plans this weekend, run out and see it. All right, so now we move on to the final topic of the day. And the final topic today comes to us from Jeremy Shook, who writes, Hey, John, loving all the content. Thank you so much, Jeremy. My question is, kind of piggybacking off a question from the last show, I agree with you that I do not think there will be a Pirate 6, or that I think there will be a Pirate 6. But I was wondering, what were your thoughts about a reboot? Do you think Disney would even be willing to make another one without Jack Sparrow? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Jeremy. And yeah, we were talking the other day about how there's this perception out there that, oh my goodness, Pirates of the Caribbean was a big flop, the newest one. It's like, no, it wasn't. It may nearly, it's, it's probably by the end of the day, um, it will probably cross $800 million. It's already really close to $800 million worldwide, right? It basically has made pretty much roughly the same amount of money that Wonder Woman has. Wonder Woman's made a little bit more, but it's basically made the same amount. It's in that same bracket of money makers as Wonder Woman. We can't, on one hand, go, Wonder Woman is a huge smash success, and then take another movie that's made roughly the same amount of money like Pirates and go, oh, what a bomb, what a failure. Qual We're not talking about quality in the film. And I didn't think Dead Men Tell No Tales was horrible. I didn't think it was horrible. I thought it was all right. Uh, I think it was the best Pirates movie. Let's put it this way. I enjoyed the most recent Pirates of the Caribbean movie, Dead Men Tell, Tell No Tales, more than I've enjoyed any other Pirates movie other than the first Pirates movie, which I love. The first Pirates of the Caribbean movie is amazing. But anyway, so... I do believe that Disney will ultimately go back and do part six because they know there's money to be made. So I think they will do that at some point. But you're asking, could they reboot it? Could they do a Pirates of the Caribbean without Jack Sparrow, without Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow? Now, to every rule in life, there are exceptions. And one of the things that I always say is, the, care, the, the movie comes first. The story comes first. Who cares if an actor comes back? I mean, yes, it can be significant, but ultimately... The character is more important than the actor. Put them in, blah, blah, blah. But with every rule, there are exceptions. Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow may be that exception. Because the franchise is called Pirates of the Caribbean, but honestly, it might as well be called The Adventures of Captain Jack Sparrow. Because they build these, and they build these movies around Johnny Depp's Captain Jack Sparrow. That's what they build these movies around. They are built around Johnny Depp playing that character. So while I am normally all about, no, the character comes first, the movie comes first, actors are interchangeable, you can change them up, just get another really good, talented actor and blah, blah, blah. But I think Pirates of the Caribbean might be one of the exceptions because, like I said, this whole thing is built on him. It's built on Johnny Depp being Captain Jack. I can't do a good check, Captain Jack Sparrow. I'm terrible at it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think you can. I honestly don't think... I think once they're done with Johnny Depp playing Captain Jack, I think they're done with Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, as far as reboot goes, well, anything can happen 15 years from now or 20 years from now or whatever. At some point, once, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise is done and tucked away, at some point in the future, do they want to come back and reboot the franchise and do it all again? Yeah, probably. Why not? And I've got no problem with that. But it would be without Johnny Depp unless Johnny Depp comes in and plays like some old pirate who's a different guy altogether just as a cameo. But I think they do something completely different. So anyway, that's just my thoughts on that for now. All right, guys, that'll do it for me for this installment of the John Campion Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey, listen, one of the things I wanted to mention here is, uh, as many of you guys know, I left the corporate world. I decided I didn't want to do this stuff for corporations anymore. So, uh, you know, and I've worked for some wonderful corporations, but I just didn't want to work for corporations anymore. So I left my other jobs. I came and started this thing on my own. And the only reason I'm able to create all this content, 70 to 100 videos a month, is because of my Patreon supporters. My Patreon supporters make this possible possible. We get Patreon over on my Patreon page. We do the audio only version of the John Campy podcast. We do some exclusive
exclusive audio-only podcasts as well, other perks for Patreon supporters, head on over to this URL, www.patreon.com slash John Campia. Check it out and see if maybe being a Patreon supporter is something you would like to be as well. And if not, that's totally cool. I'm just happy you're here watching the videos with us. Anyway, guys, leave your thoughts in the comment section on any or all the topics that we discussed here today. Make sure you follow me on social media right here at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining me today, guys. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye.